Jessica Gonzalez. I'm the co-CEO of Free Press. We come together today less than a week from, the, from an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol where five people died. We come together today as the FBI uh, released information yesterday noting that there are armed protests planned in all 50, at all 50 state capitals and at the U.S. Capitol uh, during the week of the inauguration next week. And we come today together because Facebook still, despite all this, and despite that this is on top of years and years of white supremacist violence being organized on its platform, still has failed to take adequate action to protect our democracy and to protect public health and safety. So in a few minutes, you're gonna hear briefly from a series of experts on these issues, and then we will open it up for Q&A. But before we do that, um, I want to just remind you of the four demands that we are issuing to Facebook today. They are these. First, we are calling on Facebook to permanently ban Donald Trump from Facebook and remove all existing content. Second, we are demanding an immediate audit of all content flagged for inciting violence. Third, the immediate removal of all stop the steal and related posts. And fourth, a public and transparent system of enforcement. You'll see more details in our press release that you can find at the Real Facebook Oversight Board uh, Twitter handle. But before I turn it over to Heidi Byrick, who's the co-founder of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, I wanna also just say we, we're calling on Facebook advertisers, shareholders, and employees to demand institutional change from Facebook including the removal of Mark Zuckerberg as CEO. He's proven that he is not up to the tax of protecting our democracy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Heidi, who will be um, bringing you up to speed on um, how we have gotten here and um, how Trump has incited violence on Facebook. Heidi? Thanks, Jessica, and thanks to everyone here. Um, I just, I'm going to set the scene a little bit on why the demands that Jessica just outlined are so, so critically important. So I have here a picture of the Charlottesville rallies, and anybody who looked at those rallies three years ago couldn't help but think of them in the context of what happened at the Capitol. We should not forget that the, the Charlottesville rallies were organized off Facebook. And what happened at the, at the Capitol last week was also something that was directly organized off Facebook through Stop the Steal messages and so on. These people, the people who were there at Charlottesville, many of whom their organization showed up again at the Capitol, but in this time period, Trump has actually managed to swell the ranks of far-right extremists to the point where those terrible, terrifying scenes were there. Now, incitement to violence by Trump is nothing new. Facebook has known that all along. Way back during the campaign, he was threatening to punch a protester in the face. He posted images um, of himself beating up a CNN reporter that were spread on Facebook. He threatened elected officials like Ilhan Omar. She received death threats after some of the material Trump uh, shared. This has all been hiding in plain sight if Facebook wanted to pay attention. Another major issue is that Trump has used social media accounts, including Facebook, to encourage the QAnon movement, which is directly connected to violence. And it's hard to imagine didn't even exist four years ago and yet made up a lot of the ranks of the people that we saw storming the Capitol this past week. Now in 2020, things simply got even worse than what Trump had been inciting in the years before. These are the liberate posts that he put out in April to attack the lockdowns to, that were protecting us all from COVID. These, these particular messages, Liberate Minnesota, Michigan, and so on, brought extremists into the streets, militias, boogaloo boys, and so on, and, and, and started building the movement we saw at the Capitol. I just wanna remind everybody too, that not too long after those Liberate posts, Trump posted the horrible, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. This was an anti-Black uh, Lives Matter uh, post, 
and the Black Lives Matter folks who were fighting for racial justice in this country over the summer ended up being on the receiving end of violence from those same groups that Trump uh, led into the anti-lockdown protest. There were attempted bombing attacks on BLM protesters, car attacks, all of this was coming off of uh, Donald Trump's feed. And I just wanna make a point here too, what you see in front of you is his postings on Twitter and his postings on Facebook. And we need to remember that everything that went up on Twitter, which people mostly think about um, when they think about Trump also was hosted by Facebook and thus reiterated and sent out. Now, Mark Zuckerberg failed completely in the wake of the looting shooting post. He gave Trump a pass from Facebook's own policies, thereby allowing a political figure whose statements of course carry more weight to incite violence. And within you know weeks, we've got plots against a sitting governor and lots of other violence. What happened at Kenosha, for example, also again, militias active on Facebook in that case. This pattern, uh, all led up to what happened at the Capitol. This is Trump posting about the rally on the 6th, which drew people uh, who were looking at his Facebook comments to Washington, D.C. from so many extremist groups, it's almost too many to count. He pushed the Stop the Steal, which has led now to us having a movement in this country involving lots of factions of the far right who don't believe in our democratic institutions, don't believe the election was free and fair, and we really have an opposition movement that's quite scary. I mean, Trump even you know, was attacking Mike Pence, of all people. And these posts, these things Facebook did, like this label here, they're just not enough to tamp down what resulted in what happened at the Capitol. So this is how it ended, right? The Confederate battle flag for the first time ever being walked through the halls of Congress. And Facebook bears great responsibility for this. And I have to say that the comments by Sandberg yesterday that they had 69 days after the election taken down all the stop the steal stuff is embarrassing. Trump's material is still up. All those posts that I showed, I captured off Facebook yesterday and we've still got stop the steal material on Facebook today. It's just an absolute tragedy and it has led to a terrible undermining of our democracy. So thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you for for setting the scene for us. I'd like it to turn it over to Yael. Yael, of course, you used to work at Facebook uh, in the heart of these types of issues. What's your take on what's happening right now? So the events of the past week, they make it clear that something has to change. Now let's be clear, the blame for President Trump's incitement to insurrection lies squarely with Trump. But of course, the biggest social media companies, most prominently my former employer, Facebook, are absolutely complicit. So my brief statement today is focused on the emergency at hand and why we can no longer allow Facebook to monopolize our public square unchecked. It is not meant to imply that Facebook alone is responsible for where we are today or to talk about all the ideas for how to create a healthier info ecosystem. So when I joined Facebook in 2018 after the Cambridge Analytica scandal to lead this new team of elections integrity operations for political ads, the very first thing I tried to do was to ask our teams how we can build in systems to tackle disinformation in political ads. It was a no brainer. They're profiting off of lies through the advertising side. Even if we believe the organic side is the more important stuff, at the very least, they shouldn't be profiting off of lies and ads and selling targeting tools to those liars. It's not hard, Facebook could have absolutely tackled it. And despite the enthusiasm from many members of my team, there was no appetite from above and I was eventually pushed out. I wanna be emphatic. I believe that Mark Zuckerberg's decision to allow politicians to use his platform to lie, even in advertising that they take money from for, is one of the most blatantly dangerous moves he has made. Now, since he and Nick Clegg announced that choice last fall, there's been a growing chorus of academics, journalists, civil rights leaders, advertisers, employees, and legislators warning about the dangers that were coming. And yet Zuckerberg refused to budge. Despite a huge swath of society crying out, we remain hostage to Zuckerberg's ideology and business decisions. And his moves now are somewhat politically convenient. Zuckerberg didn't choose to act against Donald Trump until after the US Congress certified Joe Biden as the next president of the United States. So it's very hard to view this decision and its timing as some form of responsible stewardship of our democracy. 
So now I hope we can at least agree that it is unacceptable to leave it to Facebook to regulate itself, to write its own rules, or to decide how they will run the global public square. So here are my bottom lines. Facebook intentionally scaled to dominate our public square. That was a choice, but they don't wanna bear any of the responsibility of the guardian of that public good. It's time to reclaim our public square from for-profit interests. Civil rights leaders have warned him, academics and journalists have warned him, employees including me have warned him, even Congress has warned him. But Mark Zuckerberg thought he knew better than all of us and he has proven he cannot be trusted to monopolize our public square. Now in the long run, I do hope we can address these larger systemic issues of how Facebook is designed and monetized and how it contributes to radicalization and I've written and spoken at length about that. But we must go beyond just content moderation and start addressing the damaging effects this business model is having on us. But for today, I simply want to repeat, if it is too hard to protect the public square at scale, then you should not have the right to dominate the public square. It's time to define responsibility and hold these companies accountable for how they have aided and abetted criminal activity, in this case, an attempted coup. And it's time to listen to those who have shouted from the rooftops about these issues for years, as opposed to allowing Silicon Valley leaders to dictate the terms. Thanks so much. Thank you for that, Yael. I wanna to turn to Jonathan Greenblatt, who is the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League next. I think a lot of people have likely seen Arnold Schwarzenegger's video noting how recent events triggered memories from Kristall Knott. Jonathan, are we learning from history? Where do we go from here? Well, I'm not so sure we are, Jessica. I would say that what happened last Wednesday was the most predictable terrorist attack in American history. And as we've seen through many recent tragic events, including the, this, again, act of terror perpetrated not by protesters, but by militants. It wasn't a mob. It was an attack. And it was facilitated by social media, which allows hateful and extreme views to spread faster than ever before, to go mainstream and to be normalized. It radicalizes individuals, helps these groups recruit new believers, and strengthens belief in dangerous conspiracy theories. As Heidi said before, QAnon didn't even exist four years ago. And now it is one of the dominant threats on the extreme right. At ADL, we've been monitoring the concerning rise of violent domestic extremism for decades. And we've seen the way national leaders, including President Trump, have enabled and empowered this hate to spread. This is white nationalism is a global terror threat that will outlast President Trump's time in office. And we've got to act now if we want to arrest its ascendancy. As we've seen for decades and so acutely in the past few years, White supremacy doesn't discriminate. Toxic anti-Semitism is at the core of its ideology, but it targets blacks, Muslims, Latinos, immigrants, and all those whose very existence is regarded as a threat to their racist world order. There is a through line from Charleston to Charlottesville, to Pittsburgh, to Christchurch, to El Paso, and now to Capitol Hill. Indeed, the Trump presidency will be bookended from Charlottesville to Capitol Hill, these two explosive violent spasms of white supremacy. The events of last week were the latest example of why it's essential that policymakers and social media companies urgently take action, concrete action, to prevent future violence. But there's really no time to wait. ADL Center on Extremism right now is tracking extremists we're discussing and planning additional violent activities. Some of this was reported this morning in the papers, what the FBI is seeing. I can tell you around January 17th, around January 20th, in DC and around the country, our analysts are seeing incredibly disturbing chatter. So Facebook's deplatforming Trump was an excellent step, but two weeks is not enough. As Jessica said at the top, it needs to be permanent. They need to enforce their terms of service and demonstrate moral leadership because I don't care whether you're the president of the United States or the president of the PTA, the same rules must be applied to everyone, particularly those whose reach and influence makes them the deadliest purveyors of hate. 
their amplification of violence and extremism is so profoundly consequential because of their global scale, as Yael said, and not for the least their refusal to adequately enforce their own policies. That's why we helped to organize the Stop Hate for Profit campaign last summer with Free Press and Common Sense, the NAACP, Color of Change, and many other civil rights groups. And Facebook indeed made some concessions, but not nearly enough. We need to increase oversight, accountability, and transparency. And I can talk about the specifics in the Q&A, but the last thing I would say is we really hope the new Biden administration that already is thinking about these issues will consider convening a cabinet level task force. So on day one, they are launching a process that looks at the rise of white supremacy and the rise of right-wing extremism and the role of the social media companies in contributing to that. Again, we will need a whole of government and a whole of society approach if we hope to solve this problem. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I wanna turn it over to Reed Galin um, with the Lincoln Project to speak to partisanship in the context of what is happening. Reed, is, is this a partisan issue? Um, it shouldn't be, um, but we see that even in the context of today, um, too many Republicans, and I'm a former Republican as many of our uh, members and, and founders are, um, understand that what you see now, um, just briefly, and then I'll get to Facebook, uh, these calls for unity and peace and everything else are really just calls for appeasement of Trump uh, and Trumpism and those that would support him, uh, whether or not it's in Congress, whether or not it's in the White House or the people that stormed the Capitol last week, because they don't want the fight. They don't want to have to stand up for the, the principles that so many of us fight for every day on this call, so many Americans and people around the world are giving their lives for. Um, <clears throat> let me talk about Facebook. I mean, if we think about this in a different, a little bit of a different context, Mark Zuckerberg is the dictator of a community of billions of people with what, 17, 20,000 people, apparatchiks who work for it, who is literally accountable to no one. Um, and the pictures that, that you see of him in the Oval Office with Donald Trump is because they had a symbiotic relationship with one another, which was Trump needed Zuckerberg and the Facebook platform to continue having his you know, followers spread their messages, not only to one another, but to friends and family that you know, extended the right wing damaging ecosystem. And he needed Trump to make sure that there would be no regulatory uh, or antitrust operations that would come into play uh, that might damage Facebook's uh, financial underpinnings. We should not expect that, that, I mean, look, Mark Zuckerberg's an engineer, right? Like he's not, he has no morality built into him. He, he is like a walking, talking AI platform. Um, he has no conception or apparent desire to understand what it is he does as a fact, you know, a, a, a reality-based troublesome and damaging and deadly effect on the United States. And here's the other part. And then, uh, you know, I'm happy to take more questions in the chat. Facebook is an American company, but for the work that, you know, nerds at DARPA did back in the seventies and eighties, Facebook would not exist, right? It is an American company built on technology funded for and created by agents of the American people. And he does not seem to care about that. He doesn't care about that. And I, I think as other people, I have many friends that work at Facebook. Uh, I know there are many veterans of Facebook here too. And the one thing that I've always found most disappointing but not surprising when I talk to them whenever there's a new democracy initiative out of Facebook is, oh yeah, we're doing that, but it doesn't mean anything. Because there is no authority at the top to change anything because they don't want to. And I think that it will only take a sustained uh, effort and, I, and, and you know from legislative bodies, from executive bodies, from activist bodies that will finally push Facebook to a place where it must take responsibility for its actions. And I will just leave this with one last thing. Last year, we did a, a, an ad called Morning in America uh, that got Donald Trump's attention and he attacked us. Facebook pulled it down because they said it was somewhat misleading. When I called to say, well, what about all the QAnon stuff? They said, nothing we can do about that. Your ad's misleading. There's nothing we can do about that either. So let's be clear. They can do what they want to do when they choose to do it. They just choose not to. Thanks so much. Thanks, Reed. Really appreciate that. I want to take us over to Shereen Mitchell, who's the founder of the Stop Online Violence Against Women 
uh, group. Shereen, where is the line and, and are Facebook's policies or wherever this line is, uh, are the policies consistently enforced? So thank you for having me. Um, as, as an organization, Stop Online Violence Against Women, we have tracked since 2013 the way in which these platforms basically um, have completely different biases in terms of who gets to speak on their platform and who doesn't. And one of the things I want to make sure that, that I say here in this conversation, when we track these things, we're, we're also saying that there are certain voices that are being silenced. Black women, women of color are being silenced for saying the words white people, while those who are trying to incite violence, those that will say things like shoot them all when it comes to black, uh, black lives or Black Lives Matter or activists are given free reign. This is why what happened in Kenosha happened, right? Someone who even, even being reported that there was an activity was going to happen. Um, we ended up with, uh, with um, people killed because you know, those who are targeting us are fine. But those for us to just simply say, we want to speak up about racism, we want to speak up about sexism, we want to speak up about, about the state violence against us, that somehow we're the ones that, that are more violent and our speeches are, are actually removed from these platforms. People are banned and suspended for 30 days and more. While those who incite violence, including, including the person in the highest office on the land, is given space to not only do that, but also threaten the lives of other officials. When we have conversations about what happened to Elon, um, Ihan o Omar, Maxine Waters, uh, we can go all the way back to to Frederica Wilson, who was defending um, um, La David, uh, La David, uh, La Sergeant La David's wife, uh, who basically had gotten offended by the things that Trump said after his his after after he was murdered in Niger. We are not looking at the same. Um, ask access to these platforms and the way in which they implement their moderation process is, is also has been very clear that for us to speak up for our freedom of speech is, is also is, is silenced while others who are actually inciting violence and trying to commit harms against us are given a platform and elevated. And these are the types of things that I want to make sure that we have to remember. What happened on Wednesday, January 6th, is no different than what happened in 1898 in North Carolina and Wilmington, where there was an insurrection and a massacre. That is the country that we are in, and yet we had a platform that helped extra help make that happen. And, and, and they are now defend, basically saying they had nothing to do with this, that they were not a part of this. This is the same platform that allowed the state that it eventually uh, committed a genocide in Myanmar. We are not having the same conversations about what is happening in our democracy across the globe, but especially here. We are not allowing these platforms to continue to do this. If they cannot defend our democracy, defend the safety of all users, I make sure that our voices are amplified just as much as those that are, are, are trying to commit harms against us. This platform basically without fail continues to protect those that want to incite harm and, 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 and try to commit violence against us versus those of us that are trying to defend, defend ourselves from those harms. Those for, who are here trying to speak up and use our democracy. Those of us who are trying to vote, they're actually allowing these platforms to silence us in, in that capacity as well. So when we look at these, these aspects of voter suppression with Stop the Steal, which is now a digital voter suppression um, process, these are the type of organizing that's happening that not only impacts democracy, but in, impacts the American lives, particularly um, black and brown lives. And I speak up about this every day because this isn't new. We have watched this for years. And what we've learned on the 6th is what we've always known about this platform. They will wait until there's death upon, the, uh, upon our country before they will take any action. And if that's the case, then either they need to be regulated or Mark Zuckerberg needs to step down because this is not something that is acceptable for, for any of us as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much, Shireen. Really appreciate that, pointing out the different ways um, that they've either held or not held the, the rich and powerful accountable and the different uh, application of their rules to, to black folks and other people of color. Uh, I wanna wrap the remarks portion um, by going to Shoshana Zuboff. We also have a number of other oversight board members on the screen today who will be available for the Q&A section that will start momentarily. Shoshana Zuboff is the author of The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, 
Shoshana, can you offer some closing thoughts before we take questions, please? Thanks so much, Jessica. And I will be really, really brief. I'm, I'm so um, humbled and moved by all of the remarks that I've, that I've just heard. Um, and it, it really moves me how long so many of us have been saying these things. And now we're at a moment when history is exploding in our faces. So I want to just zoom out a little bit and try and put what we're what we're saying in a in a in a context. The way that I look at it at this is this: Facebook is to our social order what Exxon Mobil is to the Earth's climate. That's where we are right now. ExxonMobil understood the effects of CO2. They called it the greenhouse effect. They understood its consequences in global warming as early as the mid 1970s. What did they do about it? Not only did they suppress their own scientist research, but they orchestrated a global disinformation campaign intended to gaslight, bamboozle, disorient, and disarm not just one country, but all of humanity in the face of the greatest existential threat imaginable. Now, what we know about Facebook and Mr. Zuckerberg. Facebook's own data scientists and engineers, brilliant people like Yael, have produced excellent research for many years, demonstrating the causal relationship between the corporation's economic imperatives as they are expressed in its algorithms and the explosion of right-wing extremism, of hate speech, of incitements to violence and of lethal campaigns of disinformation. But like the executives at ExxonMobil and for the sake of profit and for the sake of political appeasement deemed necessary to protect that profit, Mr. Zuckerberg chose to suppress the data, to ignore its implications, and to continue to double down on his corporation's policies and practices. And like those oil executives, Mr. Zuckerberg, Ms. Sandberg, and their executive team have engaged in their own campaign of disinformation, hiding their culpability in a fog of gaslighting, bamboozlement, insulting the First Amendment in a way that I regard as virtually sacrilegious with their crackpot and self-serving version of First Amendment fundamentalism. Finally, like those oil executives, Mr. Zuckerberg has chosen to play the role of bystander to destruction and death. The paradox we face is that democracy is under siege, but only our democracy can resolve this crisis. And that's why I'm so proud of this group, so proud to be associated with each one of you because I feel that our role can be and has been the public education and the exhortations to our lawmakers. This is the time to act. There is no turning back. This decade is essential. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Shoshana. We're gonna to go to Q&A now. I just want to recognize 
the other Real Facebook Oversight Board members that are on the call and available to take questions, but that did not provide opening remarks. So I, I see here Linda Bonio, um, Mitali Jane, MP Damian Collins, Jim Steyer, and Matt Rivet, Safia Noble, and Madiha Ahussein. It's good to see all of you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we're gonna go to questions. Just please for the press, if you can have your chat function open, it'll make this go um, more swiftly. And we'll go first to Lawrence with the Daily Telegraph. You can turn your um, your video on when you come in to ask a question. Hi all, great. Thank you very much uh, for doing this. Um, if it's all right, I have uh, two questions, one of which is directed to Demian Collins and one of which is directed to uh, uh, Shazana Zuboff and then uh, sort of widening out to anybody else who wants to ask it. Um, the one for Damien is, um, you know, we've been talking about this all in the context of US political dysfunction uh, and, you know, the particular problems that the US has with uh, white supremacy and sort of neo-Confederate ideology. There's a lot of that, there's a lot of very specific elements of that or ways in which it presents specifically in the US, right? And I'm wondering, you know, as we come up on this year, we've got vaccines to distribute, we've got still probably lockdown measures in place and needing to be abided by for a long time. Uh, what implications do you think uh, last week's events have for uh, folks in the UK and folks elsewhere as well? Um, and then the second question for uh, Shazana Zuboff and, and anyone else who wants to jump in is, you know, you're saying it is, it's now the time for lawmakers to act. And I wonder, you know, is there any specific form of regulation that you think is, is um, urgent given what we saw last week, right? I'm sort of, there's a lot of different uh, regulatory remedies, there's uh, antitrust and, and breaking up Facebook and creating more competition in these kind of matters. There's privacy regulation, there's regulation of the algorithms themselves, which doesn't really exist yet, but could, uh, content moderation standards, all sorts of stuff, something I'm not thinking of. And so I'm wondering, what do you think the most fruitful avenues are um, to actually act on this? Thank you both. Um, right. Th thanks a lot, Lawrence. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think there are a couple of things that are important for the UK, uh, looking at what happened in America last week. Um, and also in the context of the fact that we will see the UK government present its online harms bill uh, before Parliament this year. Um, we had the response to the government white paper before Christmas. Um, the approach the UK government will take through the online harms legislation is similar to the proposal set out by the European Commission. Uh, as well, um, and they you know, create a schedule of harmful content and an expectation that the social media companies will act against that content. I think one of the interesting things that comes out of what happened last week is that disinformation, harmful disinformation, has largely been defined by the social media companies as being um, content that is likely to cause immediate and imminent physical harm. Um, they've acted against you know, conspiracy theories saying that 5G signals cause um, coronavirus because people started setting fire to mobile phone masts. Um, they would act against something that said, you know, drinking bleach cures you of your coronavirus because it could, A, is not true, and B, would cause considerable harm to somebody. But what about when that harm is not just to an individual, but to society? And I think what happened last week demonstrates that if over a sustained period of time, a community is subjected to a relentless campaign of disinformation, it changes the way they think and the way that they act. And therefore that can be harmful as well. That, that sort of disinformation can be harmful to society, democracy and to public institutions. So I think we need to think about that in the context of the online harms uh, legislation when we, when we move on that uh, this year. I think it's also demonstrated, particularly the response of the tech companies that the idea that they are not responsible for what's on their platforms I think you know, they, they have demonstrated themselves now that they are the editors and curators of what goes on. They can intervene when they want to intervene and they do so based on their own subjective judgment. I think what I would say, and I think you know, the online harms legislation is part I think, of the UK's response to this is that these fundamental questions that are so important to our public institutions, our democracy, our society, this should not just rest solely in the hands of people like Mark Zuckerberg of when to act and how to act there needs to be a legal regulatory framework within which we expect social media companies to act that is established by parliaments and isn't just led, isn't just ultimately down to 
the amount of public pressure the CEO of a tech company feels at any one moment in time. Got it. Thank you. And just to clarify, you you know we're talking about you're talking about there the sort of uh, movement building or, or worldview building capacity of this disinformation. It's not it's not about one isolated piece. It's about sort of building a, a network uh, who who live in a, a somewhat different world. Do you think that has been uh, a problem in the UK and has been linked to some of the the problems the UK has seen during the pandemic? Well, I think we've seen we've seen it. I think as many other places in the world have seen it through the rise of coronavirus conspiracy theories. I think that's a really, it's, it's, it's an example outside the remit of politics where you can see people can, something new comes along, people's view of that can be shaped by what they read uh, on, on social media. And if someone is orchestrating a relentless campaign of disinformation based on lies that could harm civil society because it could persuade many people not to take a, a coronavirus vaccine that they should take, or it can undermine confidence in public institutions or public bodies or even an election. And, they, and the information people are being sent is baseless, you know, or, or just downright lies, then we should say actually there is a harm there too. And not just the immediate physical uh, risk of disinformation causing harm to somebody, but actually the wider impact on society as well of, of information, which is a sustained campaign of lies. Thank you very much. Um, Shazana Zubov, I'd um, love to know what you think uh, about the regulation piece. I can uh, restate the question uh, if that's useful. Of course. You know, I think one thing that we should um, really underscore is that what, you know, what we've just seen happen in the United States has been going on in many other countries for uh, unfortunately uh, quite a few years. Um, by, by 2018, we knew about um, 28 countries where uh, disinformation, incitements to violence, the whole panoply of things that we're talking about had already um, created violence and undermined fair elections in, in, uh, in these countries. This is not a US phenomenon and none of my remarks were meant to be solely about the United States. Uh, in fact, um, we're late to the party and we're late to the party because uh, only recently have we uh, had somebody like uh, a Mr. Trump in the White House, something so unimaginable. Um, this is a good time to feel optimistic about democracy despite everything that's happening. Uh, because we actually have some really important, I would say, breaking ground into a new generation of lawmaking. And it's happening in Europe. So Damien mentions the online harms bill. I mean, this could potentially be game changing as far as uh, the kind of uh, legal framework that's it's we're not just talking about breaking up companies and producing you know uh, a variety of versions of the same economic and political logic that we've already got that's not going to get us anywhere what we need is legislation that allows us to really address and contest and interrupt and outlaw the underlying mechanisms that reflect the economics of these companies. So that means we're challenging massive scale extraction. We're challenging the range of targeting mechanisms that have the effect of doing exactly what Damien was talking about. They break down the old boundaries between the virtual and the real worlds so that we're using the subliminal cues, the online engineered social comparison dynamics, the psychological micro-targeting, we're using it online, but we're producing effects in the real world, like we saw on January 6th and as we've seen in many other places. So these are the, this is the nuts and bolts, but these nuts and bolts are expressions of a systematic economic institution. That's what we need, the legal resources, the power to address. And um, the online harms bill can get us closer to that. The Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which were introduced by the 
uh, European Commission on December 15th to the European Parliament, these are also groundbreaking. And my strong, strong hope, uh, and I spoke to the European Parliament a, a few weeks ago and exhorted them, uh, if this is resourced uh, with the people and the financial muscle to really make good on the promise of those frameworks, uh, then we are in a new world as far as taking back democratic governance. Uh, no more absolutism, no more unilateral power, uh, no more dictatorship. Uh, these things, these two acts, if properly sourced, will fundamentally change that game and they will be the foundations, what's happening in the UK and in the EU will be the foundations that we will build on in this third decade. So despite the gloom of our moment, uh, there's a lot happening on the horizon that is essential and um, potentially game-changing. Thank you so hey, much, this Professor. I I'm, I want to get you in, Jim, for a brief comment, and then I do want to move to the next reporter. Hey, so Lawrence, good to talk to you again. So very bluntly, there's major efforts that can be done legislatively and will happen in the U.S. So as we've talked about before, there's a major antitrust case now against Facebook that the state AGs brought that we worked on with our colleague Tim Wu and others. This is all going to get played out in the next couple of years. The call is for them to divest themselves of WhatsApp and Instagram. So you're going to see a major antitrust case against Facebook. And I'm expecting that the U.S. Justice Department under Merrick Garland will take a serious look at the Facebook case. So they're gonna have huge antitrust problems, number one. And that's gonna be largely coming from state AGs and the, uh, and the Department of Justice, but also from the Federal Trade Commission, there's gonna be a new chair of the Federal Trade Commission. So that's gonna be a very big thing that Common Sense and our colleagues will be working on. The second thing obviously is section 230. So if you've seen over, you know, Bruce Reed, who's now the chief policy guy at, for the Biden administration, um, worked for the last three years uh, with us to promote the idea that 230 needs to be totally overhauled and Facebook and others need to be held accountable for the content on their platforms. This is a major important legislative effort. And if you've seen all the commentary, uh, Lawrence, you know, and the other reporters, you know that the Republicans are calling for this from a completely different perspective. And, 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 and indeed the shamed forever Do Josh Hawley, who will live forever in infamy of his, his behavior in the coup attempt, um, is the number one guy on the Republican side who's also called for overhaul of 230. So I actually think you're going to see a major overhaul of 230 and antitrust stuff. That will pound Facebook. That is an enormous head-on threat to them legislatively and from a regulatory standpoint, because you're going to have new chairs of the FCC and the FTC now that you have a Democratic majority in the Senate. So there's going to be major legislative stuff in the U.S. And yes, we're going to obviously work with Damien and the folks in the U.K. and the EU legislation that Shoshana just referred to. But the U.S. is going to hold these guys accountable. And, and, and this is going to go at the heart of Facebook's immunity. And 230 has been a get out of jail free card for these guys for the last five years. And that ball game is going to be over for them. So I'm very optimistic that there are legislative and regulatory solutions that we will work on that, that Jonathan and the Stop Hate for Profit Coalition, Jessica and others will work on. And I think you're gonna see major, major efforts to rein in Facebook that will succeed in 2021. And let me just say, and then I promise we'll talk to the next reporter. We believe that no member of the United States Senate or the United States House should accept contributions from Facebook through super PACs, joint fundraising committees, or individually until and unless that these, these things are properly adjudicated and legislated. Um, they spend millions of dollars a year on lobbying. I know the head of their DC office, we were at the White House together. Uh, they know the game of Washington better than any other. And I would say this is that for the $5,000 PAC contribution you're gonna get from Facebook, for these members, it's not worth the soul that you have to give them, uh, you know, for a relatively speaking small amount of money. Thanks, y'all. I'm looking forward Thank to getting the much. money out of the politics here and also um, going after business models that, uh, that make hate and disinformation profitable. So um, I want to note that Yael had to leave for another engagement. I think Jonathan is going to have to also leave soon for a previous engagement. Um, we're still taking questions. If you have any, please me uh, message Ben in the chat. 
Um, but now we'll go to Tyler, who's with Newsy. Hi, all. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. I, I, I'm not sure how much you can speak to what you might be looking for on the 17th and the 20th going on, but I was just kind of curious, seeing that you know so much of what we saw at the Capitol insurrection was from groups that were removed or that Facebook said they were going to remove from their platform. Um, do you expect that a lot of these groups that have been deplatformed are going to you know, still be using Facebook in order to kind of plan these sorts of events? And if so, what are you sort of looking out for right now? This is Jonathan, why don't I take this, Jessica, and then I can, because I have Go to peel off. So what I would say, Tyler, uh, the, and, you know, my colleague Heidi Barrick here has a lot of knowledge about these kinds of groups as well from many years in this field. But indeed, we've seen a number of the groups who have been pushed off of Facebook, and it's also worth noting, pushed off of Twitter, um, moved to other platforms. They had moved to Parler. Now that's down thanks to AWS and difficult to, and what the work that Apple and Google did. They then moved to other services like Gab, Minds, Amino, VK, MeWe. There's a whole ecosystem, like an alternative reality that many of these groups migrate to. But it's just worth keeping in mind that, again, I think there's a lot of gratitude at ADL for the announcements that have been made but we'll believe it when we see it. So implementation typically at Facebook lags, I think as many of us on this call know, very dramatically and that's sort of being kind. There's much work to be done to actually make good on what they say they're going to do. I could show you screenshots today of Holocaust denialism on Facebook. That was supposedly taken down months ago. Heidi gave you examples at the top of the presentation. So what I think you're gonna see is number one, stop the steal content, QAnon content, white supremacist content will still flow on the platform. Even as number two, these groups are burrowing into darker, more difficult recesses of the internet uh, and social media, and as well, migrating a lot of their activities to encrypted platforms like S Signal and Telegram. One final thought on that. One of the things that's implicit in, I think some of the comments that Jim was making and that Reed was making we need our regulators to look so hard at the, at the effort at Facebook to, to unite their back end. So Facebook Messenger and Insta on the WhatsApp encrypted platform. At that point, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook executives can go from plausible deniability, we didn't know what was happening, 3.3 billion users, you know, hundreds of billions of messages a day, to empirical deniability. We couldn't have known what was happening. It's all encrypted. We couldn't have seen that in the first place. So I would suggest that the, when Facebook is all the back end encrypted, that, is a, that will be a real crisis for our country. And again, the points that Jim was making about policy interventions and Reid was making about demanding our politicians are not you know, indentured to Facebook will be critical in the years ahead. So we actually tackle that situation once and for all. Forgive Thanks, me, Jessica, for having to leave, but... Uh, Best of luck with the rest of the session. Thanks, Jonathan. I want to I want to make sure that I get um, Mitali Jane with Avaz, Safia Noble at UCLA, and Madiha Ahussein in for brief responses. We also do have one other question that we'll take. So if we could keep it uh, kind of tight, so we can get to one more question, that would be great. I think Mitali. Uh, I'll I'll just offer a brief illustration of the point Jonathan just made about enforcement. Um, at Avaz, our analysts just a day before the insurrection reported to Facebook a viral video explaining how people could bring weapons to DC um, and detailed instructions of how to utilize those weapons. It had uh, 45,000 views and went viral uh, before ever being taken down. And we still see stop the steal groups popping up. Um, so enforcement and a kind of continuous, rigorous um, monitoring of what is happening on the site uh, remains woefully inadequate. Yeah. I'll just add uh, to echo uh, Jessica's important point. The business models are um, re require a deeper kind of regulation and interrogation because Facebook is printing trillions of dollars off of white supremacist, violent, racist content. 
And it is allowing for the organization of racist mobs. Um, we need to be really specific and naming what we're seeing. It's not just disinformation. We're talking about the mobilization of people to engage in voter suppression, voter intimidation, racist violence against African-Americans um, and Latinos, um, people who are standing up for civil rights and for human rights to be openly attacked. Um, and Facebook uh, really uh, obfuscates the way in which it actively suppresses people who are organizing and speaking to civil rights and trying to push back on fascism in the United States. So I think we're going to have to be um, very specific with the words that we use when we talk about the role that Facebook is playing in actively cultivating um, fascist, anti-democratic, racist, white supremacist organizing in the United States. And people like me, African-Americans in this country, um, will feel the direct effects of this violence as we have for centuries in this country. There has to be some accountability and responsibility. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, I'm here today. Madiha, let's go to you. Thank you. I, I just want to quickly add, uh, folks on the call have already done a really great job of expressing the realities that we're all facing, but I think that it's important to also recognize that this isn't new. This has been happening for years, as Heidi kind of laid out for us. There's been, we can point to a series of events that have happened over the course of several years. And that's particularly true for the American Muslim community as well, where we've seen that groups, hate groups have been organizing using the Facebook platform for at least upwards of seven to eight years where we've pointed to direct instances of actual event page organizing that has led to violence or potential threats of violence in front of mosques and houses of worship around the country, specifically targeting the Muslim community. And I think I wanna just quickly tie it to your question about the coming, the next coming week and why it's really important uh, giving a nod to the demands of our groups is that this needs to be a permanent ban. So when we're looking at Donald Trump's account, there needs to be permanence to this because we know that if this is an indefinite ban and within a matter of days after the inauguration, if his, if his profile is allowed to continue to proliferate this type of content, then we're only going to see this continue and be drawn out as we know we're expecting, you know, some serious potential threats of violence in the coming week um, and leading up to the inauguration and the inauguration itself. And I think it's really important that we recognize the history and then also look you know, ahead to taking real action and permanent action that will hopefully be uh, meaningful and powerful. Thank you so much, Madiha. And you know, it, it strikes me that Muslim advocates put out a call in 2015 asking for Facebook to remove calls to arms and event pages with calls to arms. Uh, some of us refreshed that call last year ahead of the election, and yet still today, calls to arms are permitted on Facebook. It's absolutely unbelievable. Can I just uh, I, I, really quickly add to that? I'll get you in, Shireen, yeah. I, 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 we put out, a, there's a report out that came out called Shoot Them All that came out in June and July that the media basically did not touch, where we actually spent time and energy going through the groups that were basically targeting Black Lives Matter people. And so none of that was taken down. There's still groups up there that, that, that consistently do the same thing. The people who are going to be harmed are us, and there's little uh, concern uh, about what's going to happen to us on the ground. Um, there's concern about politicians. There, there's very little concern about everyday Americans that look like me who will be walking down the street while someone's trying to head to a Capitol building and, and, and hit us along the way because they can visually see who we are. Thank you, Shireen. Um, I just wanna get um, a couple, two questions in here and then we need to wrap very shortly. Um, we have one from the public. Um, You've said that Facebook is complicit in domestic terrorism. Five people died on Wednesday. Shouldn't it be held accountable? And if so, how? And then the 
second question, and I'll just um, let you mull on that while I scroll up. Sorry, the chat's a little slow. It's from Jason Kent. My, my question would point to my discomfort around unilateral removal of a US president and whether anyone believes proper controls on algorithmic amplification could have avoided even needing to suspend the account. So if you can kind of wave me down, I can get you in here to answer one of these. I'll go to Shireen and then I'll go to Linda and then we'll wrap with Damien and close. Just so, real quick, because we're short on time. I know. I know. I, I just want to say this really quickly about this this last piece that people are upset that he was unilaterally removed. The problem that we have is that all the other instances that led up to this, nothing was done. These little disclaimers were not enough. The problem that we have is what I said earlier: the moderation process of Facebook defended white men over black children. OK, that moderation process is embedded into the algorithms. And Sophia can talk more about that. But that is the key to why we're here. So the unilateral removing of an individual is not the same thing as an institution. And people keep confusing those two things. And we are just the same the same way that Twitter finally said that his personal account is not a U.S. government account. We are not having conversations about these distinctions that are important because the reason why they're so important is that he should not in his personal account been able to incite violence and target any officials in the first place. And had we for the last four years in both these in both platforms been stopping that and consistently shutting that down, we would not be in a place where people feel like they're being oppressed having their voices taken away. They should not have been given permission in the first place. They see oppression at the privilege of being able to do it when we have never had that privilege. And we're not having the same conversations. And it's very distinct that we have to have about politicians versus individuals and the differences that these, that these platforms choose to use their algorithms in, in, in disproportionate ways. Thanks, Shireen. That, that that's going into elections. We just read in the news today, um, a day ago, Facebook brought down government accounts belonging to Uganda, um, the Ugandan government, which has not happened in a long time. People have been asking questions. And I think it's important to note that America exports its social media. And I don't think that America should export its digital threats to democracy, to the rest of the world. I believe that America should, American companies, your legislators should put to account Facebook in order to save the rest of the world. Because countries like Uganda, the threats of violence two days ahead of the elections coming on Thursday. And so um, I believe that any questions directed to unilaterally removing Donald Trump from, you know, um, from social media platforms, also those laws apply to other presidents. Because ignoring this would embolden other presidents who may look like they're less you know, um, less in, in less democratic states in that particular sense. So I urge that we look at the idea of Facebook, we look at the demands that have been made here um, and ensure that these demands actually translate to, you know, democracy across the world, including, including Africa. Thank you. Oh, you gave me the goosebumps. Thank you. Um, we'll go to you, Damien. And thank you. So, so the, the first question about what should the, the liability be for a a company like Facebook, if people lose their lives in a violent protest that Facebook systems may have been used to try and create to get people to go there. Well, in the, the UK approach using the online harms bill, when that's presented, within that is a concept in UK law of duty of care. But I think it's an important principle that I'm sure could be established elsewhere too, which is a company could fail in its duty of care to its users if it didn't take appropriate action against known sources of harmful content and then someone came to harm as a consequence of that, there could be a, a direct liability for the company there. And that could apply within the context of the situation in Washington last week where people lost their lives just as much as it could do with someone who is recommended content showing self-harm and then harms themselves uh, and maybe loses their life as a consequence of that. All of that, I think, could be encapsulated in, in legislation based on establishing the principle that companies like Facebook have a duty of care to their users to act against harm, known sources of harmful content when, when they can see it. To, to Jason, to your point, I think is absolutely right that amplification, I think, is the 
is the most important thing here because the more a message is amplified, the more people see it. As we've said many times on these calls, you know, people have freedom of speech rights, they don't have freedom of reach rights. And if the company is not only failing to act against a message that's being amplified on their systems, but worse than that is actually amplifying it themselves in order to hold the attention of its audience, in order to make money out of it. It's the way the systems of companies like Facebook work. And that is the thing that we should be most focused on. I think there is a danger that the debate about what happened last week has become, and, and Facebook's role in it, has become based on uh, the decision to remove posts that were put up on the 6th of January or immediately afterwards, rather than saying, actually, this is four years worth of the system being pumped with poison and a concerted effort since November to try and persuade the American people that the election was stolen and to incite people to come out onto the streets to protest about that, whether that's Donald Trump's tweets or Steve Bannon saying we should put public officials heads on polls and comparing this moment in American history to the American Revolution uh, and, and using terms like civil war. All of this is part of a system of messages being amplified to reach and motivate an audience over a period of time. It goes far beyond individual posts made by Donald Trump in the last, in the last week. And for me, that is the real area of culpability and the real failure of companies like Facebook, that they only stepped in when things had reached fever pitch but they should have actually been stepped in earlier. And finally, I would say in the debates we're having in Europe about regulation and oversight, this has got to be about a lot more than individual pieces of content moderation, but the ability for external bodies, be it you know, government appointed regulators or academic institutions to go in and audit the metadata when something goes wrong, to look at the data the company could see, to say, okay, well, you could have seen this earlier. You should have spotted this earlier. You should have done something earlier. It was quite clear what was going on and you could see it. You shouldn't wait until there's a tragedy or a disaster before you start to act. And I think as we debate these frameworks and legislation in Europe going forward in particular, I think that's what we have to have front of our mind, that it's restricting amplification of hate and disinformation that will cause harm is probably more important than acting against individual pieces of content. Thank you so much. Thank you. This concludes this session of the Real Facebook Oversight Board. Thank you. Uh, to the press and to the members who have hung in here as we went a few minutes over. Uh, thank you all. And we are available. Um, please uh, do take a look at our press statement, which is available on our Twitter handle. Thank you.